probably like a pint of the Haas. Well brewed and interesting, but not stupidly hot pale in a beautiful country pub next to a river with a bowl of chips on the way. Potentially some kind of, definitely with the dog, um, potentially some kind of board game, um, nice chats, that kind of thing. Hello and welcome to We Are Beer People, a podcast all about the many different people who help us enjoy beer. I'm your host, Rob Cadwell, and I reckon if you're listening to this, then there's a good chance that you are one of the beer people too. You might be involved in the world of beer, you may want to find out more about the industry, or perhaps you simply enjoy drinking the stuff. So join me now as I have a chat with one of the beer people. You may or may not be surprised to hear that today we're at an industrial estate. And we've just headed through the roller shutter door into the unit itself. We're a few miles outside of Reading in England at the Hogwood Industrial Estate in Finch Hampstead, which punches above its weight in craft beer terms as it's home to both Elusive Brewing and Siren Craft Brew, two big names in craft beer which are within a few moments walk of each other. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Ruth Mitchell, Managing Director at Elusive Brewing. Ruth has a huge amount of experience across a variety of roles, working at Adnams, West Berkshire Brewery, Utopian Brewing, and of course Elusive, to name a few. On top of that, Ruth's a qualified beer sommelier, a certified Cicerone, and an all-round great person. So who better to talk with about beer and what it's like working in beer and brewing? We chat with Ruth about her journey through beer, working as a managing director, and we touch on the importance of creating the right ingredients for a welcoming and inclusive brewery and tap room. And we're starting things off today with a little warm-up quiz. So, cask or keg? Cask. Wort or wort? Wort. Can or bottle? Can. Black or West Coast IPA? West Coast. Excellent. (laughs) Luckily, Andy's left now, so we're okay. (laughs) Cellar or fridge temperature? Fridge temperature. Malt forward or hop forward? Hops, please. Lager or ale? Ale. Uh, High or low gravity? Low. Hazy or clear? Clear. Sunny beer garden or cosy pub fireplace? Beer garden. Serving at a beer festival or drinking at a beer festival? Being at home on the sofa. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye, um, beer festival. <laughs> avoiding the beer festival. Um, no, serving's fun. Serving a beer Excellent. festival. So why beer? And what has brought you here? Why beer? Um, I guess kind of at the initial point, it's kind of career-driven. Um, I wasn't ever desperate to work in beer, but I was really keen to work for a business where I could grow and progress. Uh, so I grew up in Suffolk, which, if anyone has been, um, is not known for its <laughs> industry, um, but it is home to a very lovely brewery called Adnams. Um, and I grew up drinking Adnams beers and always kind of had my eye on them as a potential place to go and work. There's not that many kind of businesses where you could go, go in at entry level and hope to kind of progress through. Um, so essentially, every time there's a job going, uh, I applied for it. <laughs> Um, and on the third time, then they let me in, finally. They got the hint. They, they got the hint that I wasn't going to go away. Excellent. And so has it always been beer uh, since you were at Adnams? Yeah, so I joined Adnams when I was 23. Um, before that, I worked for Barclays for a bit and for a local enterprise agency for a bit. But since then, um, it's always been beer or drinks. I worked for a gin company called Fishers for a bit, which was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think beer is probably where it's at for me. And what was the first role you went into in beer? So I went in as a telephone account manager, um, which is looking after national accounts, so wholesalers, um, pub company, pubs, um, punch enterprise, that kind of that kind of thing. So based on an office, but doing um, not kind of order taking sales, but kind of relationship management, that kind of thing. 
So keeping everyone happy. Keeping everyone yep. happy. Excellent. And uh, finding the kegs when they go missing. <laughs> finding the kegs when they go missing. Um, yeah, a, a lot of sales, but sales through a third party. Excellent. And did you carry on doing that for a long time or did you move on to something else at Adnams? So I did that for, I think, about two and a half to three years. Um, and I was always keen to kind of progress. That was like, that was the aim. Um and one of my colleagues in the marketing department was going on maternity leave. And so I asked if I could be seconded into her maternity role. Um, and they said yes, which is, which is great. Um, and then when she came back, um, there was still space for me to stay in the marketing team. Um, and I then took on looking after brewery tours and distillery tours um, and kind of progressed from there. Excellent. And was Adnams a company like that where you could just to progress around and, I don't know, show curiosity and ask to get involved? Yeah, I think I, mean, I might have just been really young and bullshit, to be honest. <laughs> um, I think I was really lucky that Adnams have got a very, um, when I was there, have a very strong um, female chief executive officer called Karen Hester. Um, and as part of her kind of um, her leadership, she was very keen to help other women progress she joined Adams as a cleaner and uh, over 20 year career done those different jobs ended up kind of at the top um and she, her, she was really keen to have other people do that so I was given access to uh, a mentoring scheme there was specific kind of training programs each year for who they saw as kind of women within the business who had potential to progress and there was kind of there was a lot of thought around that um, looking at like the beer industry now, I think that's incredible and incredibly sort of forward sighted. And I don't know if it still happens. To be perfectly honest, um, I might have just been there at a particularly lucky time. And there was always a thought that I think if you wanted to achieve something, then you could. Um, but I think I was also quite happy to be in different departments. So I didn't just want to be in sales. So I worked in sales and marketing. Um, the brewery tours kind of sit under events I suppose um so there's lots of, sort of different bits of the business I was lucky to work in that's really good probably not bad practice for uh, being in a brewery generally no. <laughs> where you have to throw your hat in with any other project that's happening at yeah. the time um and how long did you spend at Adnams uh, so I was there in total for just over eight years oh wow yeah um so quite a long time yeah. so I ended up um my last role there was as a um a salesperson a business development manager, I think is probably the right yeah. title. Um, so I actually moved to Berkshire while I was working for them and was looking after uh, initially some national accounts, so wholesalers and groups, um, and then some direct free trade in London um, and did that for um, about a year. Um, and then there was then some pressure from the business that they wanted me to relocate. Um, mm. And I'd already done that and gone through some sort of personal stuff to do it. So I decided yeah. that, that was the right time rather than kind of have an argument about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would just go and find a different job. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Which is yeah. what I did. Yeah. That's fair enough. And so where did you go after Adnams? Uh, I actually went to work for Charles Wells for a little bit, which was, mm-hmm. um, it was really interesting. I think a lot of people were quite surprised. Um, they don't, well, they didn't, they don't really exist as a, as a brewery anymore. They're now part of the Carlsberg Marston's Brewing Company, whatever the official name is. Um, I think people were surprised because they weren't really known as having the best beer range. Um, and that was ultimately the reason I didn't stay there for particularly long. But I did really enjoy my time there. And I learned probably more in the year that I was there yeah. about kind of commercials um, and sales and how to put together a contract, um, how to give people money and tie them up in knots and prevent them buying beer anywhere <laughs> else. Um, all of that kind the of important stuff. Important parts of business. I mean, but it's, yeah. it was really interesting because I'd never never really sort of seen that commercial side of things before. They were far more switched on in terms of um, how much profit an individual account would make. So you could like sit there and say, right, they're going to buy this much, this much beer, this much wine. Cause I also did my wine qualifications while mm-hmm. I was there. Um, and you can, this is the price I want to sell at. This is how they're going to be delivered. And it will chuck out a number of what the profit is at the end of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so from a commercial perspective, it was a really fantastic job. Um, I just wasn't very comfortable selling the range. Okay, fair enough. So it was quite a hard sell, was it? Uh, no, or, not, or just not something you were invested in? Or? I think I found it difficult to be 
passionate about it. Not that that's necessarily, I mean, not everyone has to be passionate about their job. Um, I think I found the the type of accounts I was working with probably weren't the environments where I was most comfortable. And so it's a lot of um, conservative clubs or working men's clubs or um, kind of like high volume, but not particularly interesting beer ranges. So commercially, very interesting. Yeah. Um, but in terms of really using my skills of talking about beer and yeah. selling, like selling on the product rather than selling on financials, then that's where it didn't feel like the best fit. And so where did you go from there? Um, so then I went to work for West Barks. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and joined their looking after key accounts and then uh, end up as national account manager. So looking after pub companies and managing the London sales team. Um, so yeah, that was a, initially actually a really positive experience. Um, I made mm-hmm. some really lovely friends. Um, one of my best friends I met, Wolf Curb, got to know working there. Um, it was a very interesting environment. And if uh, any of your listeners want to Google that, <laughs> um, then they might get an insight. But um, the company that I worked for went into administration a couple of years ago, I mean, a long time after I left um, due to various reasons. Um, and it's now owned by a different company. So if anyone does want to do the research, then they can see what it used to be like, but also the company as it is now is not connected to the old brewery. Yeah, it's different. There's a new name. Yeah, new, new name. So it's, yeah, now known as Renegade. People. Yeah. Um, still some of the same staff and brew team. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's actually, I mean, it's one of the most beautiful breweries. It's such a nice location, it's, isn't it? It's On a Sunday's just stunning. Day or, or something like that, where you've got the fields behind you and the sort of sheep and yeah, grazing and everything. A beautiful tap room, really beautiful brewery, stunning floor, everything kind of, um, if you're going to like build yourself a dream brewery set up it yeah. would be pretty close to that you just need the uh, public transport but at you this point. <laughs> the public transport is a bit of an issue yeah <laughs> you're waiting for a while for the for the trains and things like that and I guess at that job what was like a typical day for you when you're looking after sales and sales team um so that job was it was quite kind of field based so a lot of time um either visiting accounts having days in trade with um my team because like when I when I recruited the two guys who report into me, neither of them had worked in beer sales before. So mm-hmm. it was actually really lovely to get to see them grow and develop. Um, and one of them, Dan, is now, um, he works for Timmy Taylor's. Um, so he's still working in beer and he's nice. absolutely, yeah. uh, he's moved back north and he's setting the world on fire selling Taylor's. Um, Matt went on to be sort of head of sales and marketing at Leon C. So actually getting to see them both, grow and develop and mm. then go on and do amazing things um it's really cool and I get a lot of pride out of knowing that I played a small part in that yeah absolutely and after West Barks you moved to was it Utopian no so then I went so, and worked for Fishers so Fishers, Fishers Gym yeah. for a bit um again a really interesting role so Fishers are based in Aldborough in Suffolk mm. so um the main thing that attracted me was um, first, I love gin. Uh, Always helps. <laughs> yeah, the, that is the main thing, actually. One of our, um, the life's other pleasures. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. Um, the location was a a real plus because I, I still lived in Berkshire, but mm-hmm. I was up in Suffolk um, a couple of times a month, so I got to see my family and my friends. That was really lovely. Um, and I also, to be honest, at that point, I've got a bit. I think I was feeling a bit jaded by the beer industry. Um, I'd had a couple of pretty enough experiences at beer festivals mm. and the working environment at West Barks was quite toxic at that point um and in my head I thought well maybe it's just maybe it's just beer um and I thought I had kind of a a link to the product I was selling and I could sell the story behind it um but quickly discovered that kind of toxicity uh it's not just in beer. Uh, it definitely no, exists in spirits as well, um, which was a bit of a, I don't think it was a shock, but it was a bit of a, an initial disappointment that, um, yeah, some negative stuff happened within about, a, <laughs> about mm. a week. I don't know how much you want to go into the whole, like, beer me too No, I mean, thing. I, I think, do you feel it's changed, like, much? So I guess we're not going back so far anyway, but I've certainly seen 
I don't know how things were and how things were definitely taken for granted and were a certain way. And I think they're probably maybe still there, but they're challenged maybe more openly now. But I don't know if is have you seen it change a bit in the beer industry or do you think I've, that same stuff is still as pre- prevalent as before? I think I want to think it's changing. I think certainly people are more vocal online mm. and we're better at saying, excuse me, like you see, you see a thing, you go, that's not okay. Like we're better at doing that. Um, I don't really think the problems are taken seriously mm. though. Um, and there's almost now this culture of, Oh, oh! I better not say that, or I'm going to get in trouble. Or, oh, yeah, now I've said that. What are you going to, like? You're going to tell me that's inappropriate, or I shouldn't have done that. Like almost like it's now people are joking about it, which kind of feels worse. It's yeah. Just like, oh, so you know that what you said isn't appropriate, but you decided to say it anyway, and now you're going to joke about it. Um, yeah, there's something something a bit gross about that. Yeah, to be honest. I just feel like there's a. Uh, I don't know a pushback I think from the some of the things that have happened and maybe yeah. people are still uncomfortable and don't know how to deal with it um, um, and I think to be honest the vast amount of people um, just don't care yeah. um, and that is such a shame but I mean we have people who come into the tap room who have watched the brew dog documentary have read the articles have seen the tweets and the Instagram posts um but because they like the beer or they like the bar or because it's their favourite thing to drink or because they're a shareholder for whatever reason, it doesn't stop them going there. Mm. Some people it has, but some people it's just, well, that's kind of how it is. And actually the only power we have is to act with our wallets. And so if people are going, oh, yeah, I don't really like it, but, and then they're still going and buying beer there. That's it. I think... They don't really care that much, do they? Yeah. <laughs> so... We can be vocal and we can speak with actions, can't we, as yeah. well? I've seen it at least if you have... Um, I think you took part in Brave Noise and you have your code of conduct and things like that. Yeah, so You know, a a number of breweries have started doing, which at least maybe starts to sort of raise the bar a bit for what the expectations are of colleagues and everyone that's interacting with the business. I hope so. I mean, it makes it, it actually makes it a lot easier for us to to see where the line is. Um, So our code of conduct, for example, specifically says... Um, that we won't knowingly supply our beer or attend a beer festival that doesn't have a code of conduct that Mm -hmm. we feel is equal or at a higher level to ours. Um, Sometimes beer festivals get supplied through wholesalers and it it is hard to police, but we did quite well in sort of checking that this year. Um, And a couple of times where I've emailed people and said, I mean, a lot of times it's like the code of conduct is on the festival's website and that's fantastic because that's where we should be getting to. A couple of times for festivals who wanted to buy beer and I said, well, can you send your code of conduct through? And they said, we don't have one. Um, and came back two weeks later and said, actually, we've chatted to Camera HQ or whoever it is and, and here is our code of conduct. So actually nice. us yeah. doing something then made them think about it. Um, so that's a real a real positive. Um, I just wish every... I wish that every brewery, not even every brewery, like every business in the entire world could have a, a yeah, similar thing. you almost don't want to have to ask the question in a way or have to do it, it should be a given, yeah. I guess. But I think the fact that you are able to do that and you are able to nudge people into that is a you know, positive way of a business working. Yeah, so we have a code of conduct. Um, the tap room is signed up to the Everyone Welcome initiative. Uh, we have a zero tolerance policy for any form of really discrimination or anything like that and we try really hard to work with companies who have similar values to us mm-hmm. yeah, it's really good to i think together we can always sort of bring up you know, the standard in the bar yeah that way i've always felt though whenever i come to elusive it's always a welcoming place so you you come in you've got your bright painted uh walls <laughs> you've got your uh games consoles on ready to go um dogs are welcome which is always a great start and you often have families here there's you know games to play and all that sort of stuff um but how important do you think all of those sorts of things are, those ingredients to like a successful brewery and tap room? I think for a tap room, it's incredibly important. Um, we want to be welcoming to as many types of people as possible. Um, I think if you only want to kind of appeal to like young, hip, craft beer fan people, then <laughs> you're kind of limiting your audience. Um, we want to be a place where people can come, they feel comfortable, they will tell their friends. Um, I don't yeah almost want it to kind of be a community 
space as much as they can be. I mean, we're very small mm-hmm. uh, and we're only open a limited amount of time, but I want people to feel as comfortable as they can coming. I find it personally really important that people can come on their own and they would feel comfortable in that environment, which is why we really try to kind of welcome people. And if there's a person serving behind the bar and then only one other person in the tap room, the person behind the bar will be chatting to the person if they want to, if they want to have a conversation. Yeah. Um, it, it should be that kind of, that kind of vibe is really important. Yeah, that sort of warm conviviality yeah. and all that. After gin, was it then the turn of Utopian? Yeah, my, it's difficult. My time at Utopian was inc- really incredibly short. <laughs> um, so I joined Utopian on the, I think, 3rd of January 2020. Is that the year the world decided to end? It was the year, yeah. Yeah, that so, year. Yeah, I think so, you, had a, you had a few more months into so, it. It fully went off so, the cliff. So I had three months, which were really good fun. Um, and then I was furloughed. <laughs> <laughs> And then um, during like the flexi working, all of that stuff, then I was working, I think, one day a week. Um, but I was also kind of starting to volunteer at Elusive, if you can volunteer for a company. Um, Were you still in Reading? Or yeah, Reading so I, I lived in Wokingham, yeah. Wokingham, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I kind of started to do more with Andy, helping to brew and package and all nice. those kind of things. Yeah. And then I was fully furloughed from Utopian again. Um, and then by the time sort of like the great unlocking plan happened, I think I'd been employed by Utopian probably for about a year and a half at that point, something like that. Um, maybe a little bit less. All, all of those months do really merge into one, to be yeah, perfectly just sort of, honest. As you're talking about it, I'm just sort of casting my mind back to those what, moments. What happened and, when? <laughs> that whole furloughing thing where it was sort of on again, off again, and, yeah. you know, so where everything was, wasn't it? And it was... A long time and a short time all at the same time wasn't it it was yeah. just very bizarre um but so at the end of that then I decided I mean really I didn't enjoyed my time working with Andy so much I didn't want that to stop um I felt a lot more reluctant about not reluctant about going into London I wasn't like scared to go on a train or anything but I think I was very conscious that the London beer scene was going to take a long time to kind of get back on its feet um and with that I was very conscious that Utopian had taken me on to do a role in a business environment that fundamentally had changed and maybe didn't kind of didn't warrant it anymore um and so I spoke to Rich and said actually Andy's offered me a job um so Rich who is MD of Utopian um, and he was overjoyed. Oh. <laughs> um, and it's interesting, like we've been doing Zoom calls where yeah. like me and Andy and Rich and a load of our other sort of beery friends were all on this same call and we'd done them every week throughout lockdown. Um, and I think he was probably really pleased, firstly, that he was happy I was going to go and do a job that I really wanted to do. Um, and secondly, I think if we're both honest, it probably saved him from having a couple of months down the line having to make a, a relatively difficult business decision. Mm. Um, yeah, that, it kind of felt like the right thing to do at that time, and I'm really glad I did. Um, and you're hoping you're also doing incredibly well, and Rachel, who now looks after London, is awesome. So, yeah. Excellent. And lo- all, all lovely the things, lagers. Yeah, always, all the things always, happen yeah. the way they're meant to happen. So how did you first hear about Elusive? Um, so I'd known Andy um, through Twitter for... Several years, we actually mm. met. We met for the first time doing the Bermondsey Beer Mile, um, in a group that was arranged by Steve from Beer O'Clock Show. Yeah. Um, and I went on my own. I didn't know anyone, um, apart from Steve. I think I might have met once. Um, I was absolutely terrified <laughs> um, <laughs> to go and meet a stranger on the internet. Um, but that was kind of what you did. It seemed quite like yeah. the beginning of like beer Twitter. That was a really normal thing. Um, and Andy and his wife Jane were actually there, but I don't remember. <laughs> so I don't remember meeting him, which now feels incredibly bad and rude. But there is a picture of yeah. like literally his standing proof. with yeah. our backs together. Um, but yeah, so I first met him there, but then um, when I moved to Wokingham in 
how long it is ago now, nine years ago. Um, then obviously knew that Andy was around. He hadn't started Elusive yet. Um, but we'd see each other at beer events and things. And then when he started Elusive, um, I went to a couple of events and came and drank at the tap room and things. So we kind of got to, so got to know each other online, but then kind of became mates in real life. Um, and so then when lockdown happened and he was tweeting saying, oh, I'm still out at 10 o'clock at night doing deliveries. Oh, no. um, and my other half and I were both furloughed, both from beer, both from beer jobs, sitting at home about to kill each other. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, could we perhaps help you? And then uh, we could leave our houses and it would be legal. It's and, essential. And ev- it? yeah. It's essential yeah. and everything, uh, everything would be better for everyone. Um, and thankfully Andy said yes. So, yeah. Oh, brilliant. So it just, it starts out with helping out. Getting out of the house. It was literally, he, yeah, he tweeted something yeah. at about 10 o'clock at night because he was doing loads of home deliveries to people because mm. everyone wanted their lockdown beers. And I just messaged him, or replied or DM'd and said, you do know that I'm literally three miles away. Would you like some help? Yeah. Um, and he said yes. And so we started off doing deliveries and then um, I started doing a bit of brewing and bottling and canning and tap room. Uh, Paul, my other half, had... Uh, not lost enthusiasm by then, but I think he was quite excited at the prospect of uh, eight hours on his own <laughs> without me in the house. So as as like, long yeah, as so one of you was leaving yeah, the house, that was fine. Do, do, yeah. go and do brewing. Yeah. That sounds like a great idea. I'm going to sit here and play games. So, okay, Correct. cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then just sort of carried on, carried on from there. Excellent. And so when was it that you were sort of like brought on in an official role? Uh, official role, uh, was April two and a half years ago. I think my initial t- uh, title was head of sales marketing and events. Okay, yeah. Something like that, which in a year where there were very few events um, yeah. <laughs> wasn't really a thing. Um, but I started off looking after sales, uh, marketing, social media and the tap room. Yeah. Um, and then gradually kind of <laughs> took on more and more. Uh, whether that was a good idea or not, it probably remains to be seen. Um <laughs> But I mean, the other thing about being a small business is we all, like, although we all have areas that we look after, if there's certain things happening, then we do all get involved. So everyone works in the tap room, um, some more than others, but we do all do shifts. Yeah. Um, we all work in production if we're doing packaging. Um, we all help to mash in because we've still got a manual brew kit. So it does ideally take two people. So yeah. if there's only two people on site, whoever those two people are, one of them is. Yeah. Pouring some grain and one, one of them staring. staring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that's the thing, though. Um, so we all do get involved in in lots of different things, which is really, I think, really nice. Yeah. So what um, I was going to ask, like, what would a typical day be like then? And I'm going to say that, and obviously a cliche, but every day is different. But every day what, is what different. might happen if you're turning up for work? What might you have going on? And um, as a role there, and what would you be pitching in doing? So I guess my main the, the way we generally split things is that Andy looks after um, things coming in and the mm. making of beer, and then I look after the beer going out, sales, and marketing. Um, so I'd make sure that any orders that are coming overnight have been put onto our um, computer system. Um, sometimes that does involve doing the order fulfillment as well, again, with four people. So mm. if two of us are in the brewery uh, and one person is – out delivering then if something needs to go in a box and go out to a customer that's generally me um yeah <laughs> it, feels, it feels like there's been a lot of box filling oh. the past few weeks to be perfectly honest um but i would then um in terms of operations be looking at what's going on over the next few weeks what kind of moving parts are there have we done something like agree to be in four different places at once and if we have how can we undo that to make it workable um, do we need to think about getting empty casks do labels need to go off to print all those things that kind of um if they don't happen then we can't get beer out of the door i was thinking about that and then also think about how we can really kind of boost our sales uh, it's a particularly difficult trading environment at the moment um we do. I mean, we're we're doing okay. I feel saying we're doing well would be a real, <laughs> real kind of, a real kind of stupid thing to say to be honest, because then it could all come crumbling down tomorrow. Um, 
but particularly we want to focus on getting people into the tap room um, and encouraging people to buy our beers online as well as growing our sort of trade customer mm-hmm. base. Um, so it's making to make sure we're doing kind of regular social media interactions, um, setting up events, making sure we kind of there's always something interesting for us to talk about. That's really important. Um, it feels like a little bit of everything. Every day is different. Um, if the tap room's open, then I might be working in the tap room. Um, if we're packaging, then I'll be putting labels on cans. Um, so put the label on the can and then work out how to sell those cans and how to get those cans out to the people who've bought them. That kind of, yeah. that, that chain of work. How do you divide your time like that? Are you dictated to by when something has to happen or can you say, right, Monday I'm going to do this, Tuesday I'll do this, or anything like that? I try to be quite... Um, kind of priority focused. Um, so I was always taught, and I still use, um, the kind of square where it's um, it's urgent and important and then not urgent and not important in a square. Um, so if something is important and urgent, that's the thing that gets done. If it's something that's not urgent and not important, that's the email that sits in my inbox for about a year and a half. Um, yeah. and doomed then, to never <laughs> doomed move into another never, box. <laughs> never come out again. And then if it's um, not important but urgent or vice versa, then then things happen next. So I try really hard to kind of keep those things in mind. So often there's like fun stuff that I'd really prefer to be doing. Um but the things that are really important and time sensitive are the things that have to be done. I'm trying to be a grown up about it, I think. Um, Boo. I know, <laughs> but it, but the, this problem we have is that, again because we're a small team. The sometimes I'm like, oh, I could just go and do that. That'd be really fun. Um, it won't make any money, and it's not really the best business decision. But what the hell, it'd be great. Um, and actually, then you spend another two weeks trying to catch up from doing the fun thing. Yeah. And actually, I'd rather be focusing on driving the business forward. Um, and that also gives other people the flexibility that they can go into the fun things. And that's important. Yeah, so it's interesting when you're talking about see, separation of roles and things like that. Do you, are there areas where you collaborate as well? So for like coming up with new recipes or um, collaborations and things like that. Um, is that something that everyone at Elusive will have an input into? Yeah, um, so I mean, in terms of beers and recipes and collabs, that tends to sit with Andy and I mm-hmm. mainly, um, we do decide that. So we decide the brew schedule together. We try to sit down normally once a month, maybe a bit more frequently if we've got kind of more moving parts and we'll try to plan out, kind of definitely plan out like two months ahead of ourselves and then kind of roughly plan out maybe another month after that. Um, we're not yet in a position where we're like planning an entire year. Yeah. <laughs> that feels like a bit much. And it also probably would take some of the, it probably take away some of the opportunities because we do so many collaborations um, and people approach us and say, would you brew with us? Or could we do a beer for this thing? Um, I think if we were planned a year in advance, we'd, we'd lose that flexibility. Um, but that's something we, we both do. Uh, we both get involved in label design um we do both get involved in beer naming but for some reason my names normally get kind of vetoed and overwritten at the last moment so is it a democracy uh, here uh, or? <laughs> <laughs> that's why i think there are yeah. some things that um it is still andy's business mm. and if he wants beer to be called a certain thing then i really <laughs> that's that's it's quite that's right. fine it's absolutely fine um the pixel sort of thing sounds quite interesting like the can design yeah how, so how do you go about coming up with those ideas the designs, designing those yeah um so a mixture of things um sometimes we purchase images or purchase the rights to images um sometimes we purchase an image and then we'll draw a sort of an asset to go onto it or we'll adapt the image in some way so we'll change the color take out the sky swap the sky remove a tree move a pebble a foot to the left whatever it yeah. might be probably not a pebble um sometimes I draw the whole thing um which I do really enjoy doing but it does take quite a lot of time and again so in that kind of urgent and important thing urgent is getting the can label to print so we can sell it um and it's obviously important that it looks nice but sometimes it's Naturally. not 
the time to sort of draw an entire design. I'm not a born designer. I really enjoy doing it and I love seeing like the finished product, but the skills I have are probably pretty rudimentary, <laughs> which just means it takes me a really long time. So I'm sure that other people will have uh, loads of gadgets and ways of drawing things because we draw in pixels. I'm literally sitting there kind of like clicking every square to make it the colour I want it to be or to form the thing I want it to be. So it does take a long time. Yeah. But they're super like iconic cans. You know, iconic yeah. gets used a lot, but you always know an elusive can when you see it on the shelf. Oh, I think that's... You can yeah, find your way to it. I always think that's a sign of a, a strong brand and Andy gets sort of all credit for that really. That I think particularly now there are so many breweries out there um, and you see cans that are so beautiful and we have... Like we we buy other people's beer for the tap room mm-hmm. and the can will come in, it's oh it just it looks lovely, it feels lovely, it's like this is just a gorgeous thing. Um but then you put it in the fridge and it doesn't sell. Um and it might not sell because it doesn't actually say what the beer is. That's a common <laughs> a common issue. It doesn't say the beer name or the ABV or the style. Um but often like you've got things that look like a really amazing range when they're together, but then you put them mix in with other beers and they don't stand out um and for our beers we always want them to look like they're an elusive beer so part of our range but also if just one beer was on a shelf with a hundred other breweries you want it to stand out and be able to instantly say that is an elusive beer and it looks different to all the rest So you've obviously got a lot on your plate at the moment, um, but what have you got coming up at Elusive? Um, so we've just taken on a new business unit. Um, so when we're talking, it's now the middle of November. We're sat in it now. We're sat it's in the a, business unit now. It's, there's an office, there's a dog bed. There's a dog bed. There's no dog today. No. Uh, he would have been a bit barky, I think. Um, so we're trying to get the tap room. Uh, essentially, our plan is to have a bigger tap room, which will be in this new unit. Um, it will still very much be a kind of a, a multi-use space um, and Monday to Thursday will still be storage um, but it does mean that when we're open to tap room um, we should get a little bit more inside space which is really important for us um, and then we'll have uh, in our current tap room we'll be able to expand our fermentation capacity so we we'll have to make more beer so that's the kind of the plan for the next probably three to six months is firstly getting the tap room up and running and then bringing in that new fermentation capacity See how we can kind of juggle the schedule, getting used to having more stock, which means I have to do more selling, which I'm actually quite looking forward to. Um, so that's kind of the main sort of overarching thing. Um, before then, we have some other kind of smaller projects coming up, some small collaborations, some new releases. Um, we just started talking about our International Women's Day collaboration brew, which we do each year in collaboration with the malt miller. Nice, yeah. Um, so lots of, as your listeners probably know, lots of people do beers for International Women's Day. Um, we want to do something a little bit different um, because so much of Elusive is about home brewing, kind of wanted to bring that in. Um, and home brewing really is a very male-dominated hobby. So what we really want to do is to encourage more women to mm. give it a try and show that it can be a really easy fun, fulfilling thing to do. Um, so we'll be launching our International Women's Day homebrew kits, the, hopefully the first week in January. We said that last year and it was second week. The first half of January. January is an odd time, though, isn't it? It's so hard to yeah. pin anything down at that um, point, but that's cool. So people can prepare and get So the idea is that we will we would side on a beer and we'd bring it with us, the Malt Miller, and another brewery. Mm. Um, I can probably tell you who that is. That's confirmed. So that's going to be Burnt Mill this oh, year, which is, yeah, wow. really cool. So um, sorry in the first year, good chemistry last year. This next year will be Burnt Mill, mm-hmm. um, which is amazing because Sophie Dumond is just such a brewing icon. Um, so the idea is that the kits will be available to buy from the Malt Miller um, and people can um, adjust their kits, I suppose, so they can pick different hops or adjuncts or anything else they want to put into the base recipe. Yeah. Um, we will brew a commercial batch of the beer, um, which will then be released in late February. Um, and then we'll get together the, hopefully the Saturday after International Women's Day, which this year, International Women's Day is always the same day, but the Saturday is April, no, March 9th. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and then people will hopefully bring their homebrew along and we all try the homebrew and see what people have done with the recipes uh, and compare notes. So it's a really nice kind of collaborative project. Um, it's not a competition. Um, it's very much about um, sharing knowledge and having a good time and making friends and meeting new people. Um, last year, it was wonderful. We had a, a lovely group of women come and bring their beers um, to Bristol. This year, it'll be in London. So, yeah, oh, it's so lovely. We're, we're starting planning yeah. that um, and then other other things down the road as well. Yeah, That's really cool. I'm really excited about that one. That'd be a good one. Um, and it's cool to do it that, in, that way so you can be ready for... Uh, to drink it and jo- enjoy it, celebrate yeah. it together around International Women's Day as well. I think it's, yeah, we wanted to have a, a project that allowed as many people to get involved as possible. Um, you don't have to be a woman to brew it. You don't have to be a woman to join in. Um, it's just about raising raising awareness more than anything else and having having a good time. Very nice. And can you say what the style of beer will be or is that uh, going to be under wraps until it's announced? I think I'll leave that for people to find out in January. That's good. A nice teaser for everyone there. <laughs> Um, it's not a black IPA. I'll say that. <laughs> we'll do something else for this one. Um, and we're obviously in uh, mid-November at the moment, and we've got Calabageddon coming up. Yes, so Calabageddon is actually this week, as we're Ooh. as we're talking. It's on Friday. Um, so that I mean, the main stress of Calabageddon actually has already happened, um, except I do it's have the... another hundred social media posts. It feels like to, <laughs> to get out. Um, but Clavergeddon is something we do every year. Um, so this year it's us plus 11 other breweries. Um, everyone's matched up to brew two collaborations, one kind of home and one away. So this year we as a brewery have brewed with Polly's and with Baker's Dozen. Um, and we've got some amazing brewers involved, um, Abbeydale and Moonwake and Sure Short Tartarus. I probably should name all of them, but I can't off the top of my head. That's all right. We <laughs> can direct people to the information to the website, so they can find it all. Um, and then those beers are available in, this year we've got 25 sets of venues. So I think there's actually 30 venues, but some are, are splitting the beer between two places. Um, but it's specifically an on-trade event. So the whole point is to support pubs. Um, it's not about us having the beer in our tap room it's not mm-hmm. about selling cans online um although they will be available but we don't do like a clabageddon can set or anything um really it's about getting people to go to pubs because if you want to try those beers you have to go um to the pubs involved to try them they won't be available anywhere else um until the day after so okay. yeah it's a really again an important thing to pubs are really struggling <laughs> at the they moment. Are. yeah um, and so having something we can do to help them is is great yeah Absolutely. I think people are feeling the pinch, aren't they? Yeah, it's yeah. it's definitely you can you can just see it. Um versus not even versus time last year, but versus kind of last last spring, everything felt quite kind of buoyant. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, pent up optimism, I think. Yeah, it's point. it's now buoyant is really not the term I would use. Um every, everyone's struggling, it's it's really difficult. Like we're selling a a luxury product at the end of the day um so we've kind of i feel like we've got to work harder and do better to kind of justify people spending their money on on our beer because if you haven't got very much spare then you really want to be getting something special and that's kind of why the for me the tap room experience is so important if people are coming and they're like gonna have, go out for two pints on a weekend they want to come and have a really really good time um yeah. that that feels more important when people have got less less spare money than that value um not necessarily like being cheaper but giving more feels feels even more important yeah if they're only going to go out once a month or something like yeah, that yeah make, it, make it really amazing. good yeah memorable yeah. and all that absolutely um it probably goes on to asking you what's the most important thing about beer do you think i think for me the most important thing about beer is that it brings people together um it doesn't really see class or income or anything else probably does see income at the moment to be honest but um (laughs) it feels like a real leveler like pubs feel like a real kind of a place where people can come together and it doesn't really matter your background or why you're there um it kind of it puts everyone in the same place and i feel particularly that you've got people who are passionate about beer like we have people who come to our tap room and you would never kind of put them together as being mates in a hundred years, but they'll happily sit there and 
chat about our latest release or something that's happened in the news or what other breweries are doing. And I think that's a thing that probably isn't there with other, I mean, that might be there. It's probably there with music. It's the other kind of thing that I think is pretty similar. Um, but I don't see it being there with other products particularly. Um, so I like that yeah. it brings people together and it kind of puts everyone on the same footing. With beer, it is kind of available to everyone. Um, there is a very low entry point um, if people want to go to the local Weatherspoons. Um, I I don't, but I think it would be really twatty of me to say that people shouldn't. Um, so actually, if you've got a couple of quid, then you can go and have a half or a pint with other people in a warm space and have a chat. And that is a now more than ever a really valuable thing. Yeah, definitely. And going on from that, if you could change one thing about like the beer industry, beer culture, what would it be? I think the beer industry is a place to work. I would kind of change the culture a little bit. Um, I think there's still this kind of view that working stupid long hours and having no work-life balance and working for 12 hours and going to the pub is really good and cool and encouraged and actually it might be if that's the kind of thing that you enjoy doing but that doesn't mean you should look down on people who want to do their job and go home um it's a really weird industry that so many people have their job and their hobby and it's all mixed up and it's that makes it great because it means you're working with your friends um, and you're working on something you really care about but I do feel sometimes that goes too far um, and can have a negative effect on people's mental health it means that you're probably you're kind of balanced in how you look after your mind and your body and everything mm. else um gets a bit out of whack um and there there aren't many other jobs where you would be expected to do your job and then go out and do your job and then on the weekend go and do your job and then chat about your job to your friends Uh, it does feel like that that separation is is got a bit kind of muddy um I do feel it's kind of getting better slowly Mm -hmm. but I think particularly kind of in the the craft beer arena but actually not not limited to that's something we should um potentially be more conscious of um if we want to have people who can stay in their jobs long term and be happy and develop um particularly in production like production like working in a brewery is hard so you do a hard physical job and then there's also this kind of thought that you should go out and drink um which sadly we cannot say is very good for you. Um, and then we wonder why you've got a load of people who are sitting there coming in their late 30s, early 40s being absolutely knackered. Um, and that might be why. So if we want people to come into the industry and it be a lifelong career, I think we really need to start thinking about that a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a real potential for boundaries to be blurred yes, during this. Yes, definitely. Because we're just... Uh, doing the same thing in work and out of work. And like you say, if you love it, it's hard for you to probably turn it off or hold back sometimes. Yeah. But I think it can also cause people to to fall out of love with it, which is a real, mm. a real shame. Absolutely. Um, coming back into the positive lens. But yes. Can you tell us about what your perfect beer is? Ooh. Um, my perfect beer probably depends more on the place than the beer itself. Um how he said earlier that I would like a pub beer garden it's probably like a pint of cask well brewed and interesting but not stupidly hopped pale in a beautiful country pub next to a river with a bowl of chips on the way potentially some kind of definitely with the dog um potentially some kind of board game um nice chats that kind of thing Love it. Um, I think it doesn't, yeah. It's for me far more about the the experience of having the beer rather than the actual beer itself. I love the detail that the chips weren't there. They were on <laughs> the, the way. And the chips, the an- like chips incoming, the anticipation, the anticipation of the chips. chips. Was, uh, was high. And, they, um, and you've probably answered what do you look for in a pub, but I think you've, you've probably said that already. I mean, to me, the things I look for in a pub is would, can I, as a woman, go in on my own sit and have a few beers, maybe chat, read a book, look at my phone, read the paper, whatever, and feel 
happy and comfortable doing that because if I can then I'm probably guaranteed if I go with friends or my partner or whatever then pretty guaranteed to have a lovely time but if I wouldn't feel comfortable going on my own that's a big turn off again with with pubs for me the beer is kind of secondary I would far rather go to a really welcoming pub that's got a kind of an average beer range than go somewhere that's got like the most exciting beer range in the world but you don't feel comfortable if I want to drink amazing beer I can drink it at home yeah, like it's available, it's, 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 available. <laughs> it's there you can all yeah. good bottle shops um etc but for a pub it needs to be about the welcome and the space and the feeling of it first mm. I really agree with you about the welcome I think the thing I don't ever appreciate is that I as a white middle-aged man can walk <laughs> into most pubs and not often think about those things in the same way I think you might do though especially if you go somewhere where you're not local like I remember mm. like when I was working in sort of sales and going into pubs um it's not just women who get it like you walk into a pub and you've got five normally blokes sorry but it could be anyone five regular sitting at the bar and if all those heads sort of swivel towards the door as you walk in and they go silent I've definitely had that oh I mean that <laughs> I just thought that was me that's that point, I mean yeah. like that yeah. That can just be, they're about to say, hi, how are you? Or it can be a bit of an um, intimidating environment. You've mentioned a few of them, but have there been any people in your career that you think have been particularly instrumental in helping you, guiding you? Yeah. Um, how many people can I shout out? <laughs> <laughs> I would say people who have been instrumental as in people to look up to. Um, I would put Melissa Cole pretty high at the top of that list um I would now call Melissa a friend but for a very long time I was absolutely petrified of her uh, not because she'd done anything wrong but just I was so so in awe of her knowledge and her personality and her charisma and that she could command a room and that she would just knew so much about beer and could talk about it in such an amazing way um and I feel very lucky to have um on occasion has done events with her or shared a stage with her. And I think she's a, a pretty phenomenal human. Um, still slightly scared of her, <laughs> but, um, but just because I feel that, yeah, she's someone I definitely kind of look up to and, and respect. Um, I would say that Fergus Fitzgerald, who is um, now, what is he? Production director? At Adnams, so he looks after all brewing, all distilling, all everything, wines. Um, again, I, I feel really lucky to call a friend, and Fergus is incredibly supportive, um, particularly when I was doing my kind of beer sommelier training and learning about the brewery tours. Like, no question was too small, no question was like answered like I was being stupid. It was mm-hmm. just very kind of straight, and he's been incredibly supportive of. Um, of everything I've done so he's yeah another person I would really kind of so I, def- I definitely wouldn't be I wouldn't have my beard knowledge to the extent I do um without him or certainly not as kind of I don't think it would have come so easily so thank you very much Ruth that was brilliant um where can people follow you and keep up to date with everything about Elusive uh, so you can follow Elusive on Twitter at Elusive Brew, on Instagram at Elusive Brew, and on Facebook at Elusive Brewing. Um, and you can sign up to our mailing list on the website and all the usual stuff. Um, you can find me. You can no longer find me on Twitter, which is a bit of <laughs> is that a recent uh, uh, so they change. Um, yeah, they Twitter asked me to change my password, and I didn't want to, but they told me I had to anyway, which would have been fine if I hadn't had that password linked to a. 15 year old oh, no. email address yeah. um and for about five seconds I was devastated that I would never get my Twitter account back and now I decided I really didn't care <laughs> um, so you can't find well you can find me on Twitter you can see an archive of 15 yeah. years worth of tweets uh, <laughs> if you go to uh, go to my profile uh, but you can find me on Instagram at beer fairy which is b-e-e-r-f-a-e-r-i-e um, you can find me occasionally on Facebook, but I don't really like it. Um, you can find me in real life as a person to chat to um, at the Illusion Tap Room and at events. Uh, and personally, I think that real life is probably the 
the one to focus on. Fantastic. Cheers to that. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much to you for joining and thank you to Ruth for her time and sharing her story. You can find links to the breweries mentioned and the social media handles in the show notes. And this is the part where I ask for your help. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the podcast, leave a review or rating or share it with others. This really helps us out and helps other people find the podcast, particularly as we're starting out. And you can follow us on social media, search for We Are Beer People, all one word. You can also email us at wearebeerpeoplepod at gmail.com. Let us know what you think, share your thoughts, and if you have any recommendations for beer people you'd like to hear from. And until next time, don't forget, you, me, us, them, we are all beer people. <laughs>